before he became an academic, he had uh, other lives, we all do. And his other life informed, I think, his uh, uh, current projects. So for 11 years, he was a trade union uh, sort of worker representative in uh, Madhya Pradesh, Pradesh in India, working with small farmers and tenants and, and sort of forest users. And I think that does inform your politics and your political analysis. Uh, his PhD is in political science from Purdue, uh, and that title alone must contain a short story or even a novel. Uh, then uh, his own Oxford University Press, he publishes a book called Democratizing Nature and Development. Uh, where, uh, as a good heretic, he says, the problem of nature is not one of democratization. Um, uh, the problem is that uh, conservation uh, needs to be changed in the right? So uh, he actually uh, turns his gaze uh, upward towards conservation uh, policy and practitioners rather than downwards towards peasants and locals. And he also highlights the emerging power of rural people to really reconfigure uh, conservation uh, as it gets uh, made. So, without further ado, um, I'm a climate skeptic. Let me explain. I have become used to a life full of contradictions, and I suspect we are, all of us, are condemned to live a life full of contradictions. But then, why do I see some of these contradictions as ironies? And that is where I try to locate my politics, and that is where my politics finds me. One of the most contemporary ironies that I lived through, a contradiction, is uh, Apple versus Microsoft. Apple is now the largest corporation in the world by market capitalization. And it got there by climbing over, not Microsoft, but Exxon Mobil. One is the symbol of evil corporate empire out to destroy the world. The other is seen by a majority of my friends as very nice, fuzzy, warm glow that comes over when I say Apple. <laughs> Am I the only one who sees this as a contradiction? Climate change and development. It's not so far and it's not so far-fetched to compare it to Apple and Microsoft. I will get there in a moment. But climate change and development itself, that we are collective, we are together here to talk about, reminds me a lot about environmentalism and the discourse on sustainability. I have occasionally been accused of being an environmentalist, although I have always vehemently denied it. <laughs> But the irony of the most unequal generation in human history, talking about the rights of future generations, sounds at least somewhat ironic to me. We have amassed all the wealth that we know of and concentrated it, concentrated that wealth into the smallest possible fraction of humanity ever. And we are talking about climate change just as we were talking about environment and continue to talk about environment in the name of future generations. I refuse to participate in this island. But it refuses to let me go. Just a few days ago, I was a email discussion on a listserv that I participate, well, I lurk hardly ever participated, about uh, a, a letter written by a group of Guarani Indians in a remote part of Brazil, a letter that proclaimed that they are going to com commit, that they, they would like to receive collective death after a court ordered them to be evicted from their ancestral lands 
in favor of ranchers, who were of course create, creating all, all the conditions for them to be erected in the first place. And this evoked a number of responses and uh, it uh, evoked uh, suggestions about what could be done from the US, in Brazil, in other parts of the world, and what Survival International is doing, what uh, the Ministry of Indigenous Affairs in Brazil is doing, and so on and so forth. And one of those responses is very small, very evocative, and very ironic. It said, this breaks my heart. What could we do to prevent this? And below that was sent from my eyeball. Am I the only one who sees the irony in this conjunction of empathy? And well, that is probably unprecedented. Climate change, I don't believe, is unprecedented. But this ironical confluence of unprecedented wealth and unprecedented, unprecedented inequality layered on top of empathy that fails to see its own, its own irony is unprecedented. Now, I'm in the fortunate position of having to resolve these contradictions, if they could ever be resolved, and what I believe are differences in perception in, in many cases, with some of my closest friends. This is fortunate for two reasons. This is fortunate because I can't demonize them based only on some of their actions or lack thereof. Hey, you have a Mac. You're a bad guy. I can't do that. I know them too well. And it is also fortunate because they can't dismiss me as some right-wing anti-science fanatic. They know me too well for that as well. And this has created very productive tensions. And I want to share some of what has come out of those conversations, sometimes not so comfortable, to explain why am I a climate skeptic. Oh, don't go. <laughs> climate change discourse has taken on a, a brook no challenge, take no prisoners mode. This attitude I find in discussions of climate change skepticism and debates around climate change skepticism in the US. And these debates are particularly instructive. Debates on how those who believe in climate change talk about those who do not believe in climate change, or at least are skeptical about it. I paraphrase uh, Andrew, where he calls it, uh, this is a, a much larger coming from science and technology studies, uh, the public ignorance model of science communication, and Andrew calls it the English traveler model. And uh, it particularly <laughs> resonates with me because I live in a country formerly colonized by Britain. If the locals don't understand English, say it again in English, louder. If the locals don't understand the scientists, they are ignorant, and we need to say it more loudly with more research, more data, more numbers, more models, more whatever. Denial, in quotes, is a laden term. To call someone a denialist is to accuse. It bundles so much into two syllables. It implies that you're ignorant and perhaps stupid as well. It carries the hint of being superstitious and religious, even evangelical in the US. And you have been duped by evil corporate houses funding con conspiratorial science that is hell-bent on the destruction of life on Earth. Being a skeptic does not yet carry similar negative connotations as being a denialist, but it is getting there. It's getting awfully close. And the response to climate change skepticism from those who believe in climate change it reminds me of two episodes, one historic and another from personal experience that I would like to share with you to contextualize my concern. At the turn of the century, more than 100 years ago, there was optimism in the power of science. We all know that. This was the quantum revolution, but it was much more than that. And one of the growing fields was eugenics. US scientists were at the forefront 
of the development of the science. And they were much invested in this field. Eugenics, to put it simplistically, was derived from the emerging science of evolution, which was beginning to be consolidated by the integration of work of Charles Darwin, which was not quite quantitative, and Gregor Mendel, which was somewhat more quantitative, and put on a scientific footing by, let's say, people like Ronald Fisher and Carl Pearson. And the science of evolution itself, and the eugenics that was based on it, was fantastically futuristic in its outlook, and the operative term being fantastic, or fantasy. And the fantasy was for a bright future for all of mankind. It would have gone, and who knows where it would have gone, but it was Christian fundamentalist opposition to the teaching of evolution in schools based on an admittedly incorrect belief in creation that scuttled eugenics in the US, which is exemplified in the Scopes trial and how the liberal opposition, the science and the scientists have tried to portray it as a victory for science. But ultimately, it was the failure of eugenics in the US. Ultimately, German scientists took inspiration from this work in the US, and we ended up with the Holocaust. The other experience is closer to home, to my own experience, closer to my skin. During the 1990s, as I participated in organizing opposition to the social impacts of scientific forestry, I was commonly blamed for an anti-science and therefore anti-development position. I was not the first. There was at least a hundred years of protest that came before I began participating in this movement, beginning with colonial forestry in the 1860s. How could I not believe the science for which all forestry scientists were in complete consensus? On occasion, especially when my anti-science positions conflicted with the political economy of forestry and threatened highly vested interests, I was called a terrorist and put in jail. And I could not convince the believers, some of whom were my friends even then, I could not convince them that the science behind scientific forestry was wrapped up in a political economy of development that privileged a small section of Indian society and at great cost to the Adivasi and Dalit populations who lived in and depended on those forests. Usually the response was, how could I be so unscientific? What was in the science that I could not believe? Sort of in the sense of, which part of no do you not understand? This is the science, this is the tree ring data, this is the basal area, this is the canopy cover, these are the satellite images. What part of it do you not understand? After all, science was only for the benefit of these very people on, who, on whose behalf I appeared to be speaking. I see a similar trend with interventions designed to help vulnerable populations. Vulnerable, what a fantastic term. Again, the operative emphasis being on fantasy. I paraphrase, I paraphrase Iris Young, the feminist political philosopher, who wrote that ideas function ideologically when they represent the institutional context in which they arise as natural or necessary. They thereby forestall criticism of relations of domination and oppression and obscure possible emancipatory social arrangements. Vulnerability is one such idea. Vulnerability paints people as passive victims of forces beyond their control, always in need of assistance, always but without the capacity to help themselves, or even know the reasons for their incapacity. I'm fully aware that not all scholars use vulnerability in this way. But this is how the idea of vulnerability is being deployed by climate adaptation planners across the developing world. I just want to show you an example as soon as it comes up, which is called the CC DARE project, a joint effort of UNDP and UNEP. What could possibly be wrong with this? The CCDARE initiative is jointly implemented, blah, 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 blah. 
It provides timely technical and financial support on a demand-driven basis to countries in sub-Saharan Africa and small island developing states for flexible and targeted actions to remove barriers and create opportunities for integrating climate change adaptation into national development planning and decision-making frameworks. I'm always suspicious of sentences where I have to stop in between to breathe. <laughs> the program is designed to complement and strengthen ongoing and planned climate change adaptation and risk management activities in these countries using quick and tailored support. I'm also suspicious of sentences that uses too many ands, too many conjunctions. What could possibly be wrong with this? I want to share with you an example of a project that CCDARE has supported as a success. And this is not from the CCDARE website, although the outlook on the CCDARE website is even more positive than this. This is on the Climate L listserv. The project involves relocating human settlements from Rwanda's sloping Gishwati forest, an area that has suffered severe environmental degradation exacerbated by extreme weather events. In an effort to reduce the vulnerability of local communities and the ecosystem to climate change impacts, human settlements are being located to safer zones. The joint UNDP-UNDP-CCDARE program aims to complement and strengthen ongoing and planned adaptation and risk management activities based on national priorities. National priorities. According to UNEP, rehabilitation efforts will maximize Rwanda's chances of establishing new carbon sinks in Gishwati. In addition, the success of the CCDARE project has assisted Rwanda in leveraging additional funds, including 15.9 million US dollars from the UNFCCC Least Developed Country Fund. I don't have to remind you that this is a country whose defense minister has recently been accused by the United Nations of marshalling rebel troops in the neighboring eastern Congo with a trail of rapes, mass murder, and several other atrocities has led to the displacement of up to 5 million people in the last decade. By what article of faith are we to believe that the integration of climate adaptation into Rwanda's national development plans is likely to help its people. And by what article of faith are we to trust UNDP and UNEP that they will watch out for the people on whose behalf the Rwandan national government is seeking all this assistance? Why am I a climate skeptic then? This has nothing to do with climate. This has everything to do with politics. I witness a rising NGO consultant adaptation complex. Have you read any of the NAPAs? Have you heard any, any of, anything about NAPAs? Yes. So NAPAs are these national adaptation programs of action. And uh, the UNFCCC has uh, asked the 44 poorest countries of the world to produce NAPAs, and in many cases, to be produced on behalf of these 44 poorest countries, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa, but they are also scattered in many other parts of the world. You should read them in your copious spare time because they are long documents. But if you were to read a few of them, one is not enough. It's not fun to read just one. <laughs> but if you did, if you were to find the time to read a few of these, you would notice that all of them are almost identical. Whole sentences and paragraphs are repeated. And why would that be? It's actually very easy to, to imagine. They were written by the same consultants. Remember the PRSPs? Mm -hmm. The Poverty Reduction Strategy Papers that the 48 poorest heavily indebted countries in the world were forced to write in the late 1990s by the World Bank and IMF as part of the second or third or I forget which generation reforms, which were also very similar to each other. You couldn't tell by reading. If you removed all the place names, you couldn't tell whether it was Uganda or Tanzania or 
or Mali or, or, or Zambia that were written by the same consultants. They were also funded by bilateral and multilateral donors to justify channel, channeling of funds to national governments for programs that had a history and a record of not being successful for the last 50 years. It was very little new in any of all of the programs and projects that were listed in the PRSPs, and there is very little new in any of the projects or programs that are listed in the NAPAs. And now we have something new, because even NAPAs are now old. We now have ARPITs, the Readiness Plan Idea Notes, which are documents to document the preparedness, the readiness of countries to receive red funds, of which more than $250 million have already been pledged, although only 10 to $15 million have actually been dispersed. We know that there is a development industry, and at least some of us believe that it is not exactly operating to benefit the poor people of the world. Now the same industry is pouring the same old wine from new bottles, and I'm afraid that we are all getting drunk on it. There's a great dissertation that was defended earlier this summer, which uh, looked at the construction of seawalls in Suriname as an adaptation strategy for sea level rise to protect fishing communities. It was, of course, $100 million that Netherlands provided to the government of Suriname, which, of course, sent it back to contractors who were based in Netherlands to build seawalls that destroyed fishing communities and their livelihoods by removing their access to fishing grounds in the name of protecting them from sea level rise 40, 50, 100 years later. This is all being done in the name of climate change, of course, but it is also wrapped up in a kind of environmentalism that we are all very well aware of and have uh, endorsed heartily on numerous occasions. And that is this notion of spaceship Earth. An idea, a symbol of a shared future. But it has, I feel, and I want to share with you, acquired many more meanings that it's not just a shared future. Knowledge is now created by integrating data from thousands of automated weather stations, AWS is the word, and hundreds of satellites processed into very complex global circulation models that perhaps only a few people in, in the world can actually claim to understand. Gridded knowledge of this kind privileges the global scale over everything else. The only dynamics that matter are those of Hadley cells comprising these global circulation models that produce 100-year simulations of the Earth's climate projected into a future full of disasters. I call this high science. The credulity of hypermodernity knows no bounds, and the age of high science is upon us. And it is my humble duty to warn everyone. We now believe that changes in the concentrations of a trace gas in the atmosphere will lead to catastrophic transformations in the near future. We now believe the outputs of highly complex computer simulation models projected so far into the future that none of us will be alive. I invoke George Bernard Shaw, writing in 1922 in the preface to the play St. Joan which he wrote after Joan of Arc was canonized in 1920 by the Catholic Church that burnt Joan of Arc at the stake nearly 500 years ago. And he warned us against thinking that the prosecutors of Joan were stupid and ignorant. He warned us that we should not hold it against them that they believed in witches. He pointed to the best of us now at that time, who believe in atoms and subatomic particles and electrons that curiously revolve around nuclei that no one has ever seen. At least people in the Middle Ages had their senses to fall back upon. We are more credulous than those who believe in electrons. 
current climate models, individual or ensemble, cannot predict changes in climate variability at a scale that is meaningful for any or most adaptation purposes in any or most places. In fact, they are not even in agreement about whether precipitation will increase or decrease for almost all places where people live and work. They can tell us that temperature will increase by a few degrees here and there. They can tell us that precipitation will increase near the poles, but no one lives there. And they can't tell us what will happen to precipitation near the tropics. In contrast, in contrast to these coarse-scale climate models, we have some excellent fine-scale social science knowledge about how individuals and groups deal with change, how they are themselves the agents of these changes, perhaps unwittingly, but other times quite intentionally. And I want to draw attention to this intentionality of human behavior, individual and collective. It is not that farmers, especially those that I have interacted with over decades now, it is not that farmers I interviewed did not think climate change was important. They did. But I found a fundamental difference and disconnect between farmers and climate scientists in the evidentiary basis for claims that climate is changing and in their engagement with politicians about how to respond to what they perceive as climate change. I'm still working through this dichotomy. It has major implications for how we think about development and perhaps <coughs> how we think about democratic governments in their responses to anything like climate change. I call it the frozen bucket problem. As I said, current climate models have no means of predicting changes in climate variability at a scale that is meaningful for actual practical action. This is especially true for my field sites in the Himalayas. And the only way policymakers will get any feedback at the fine scales that it is generated about changes in climate variability is through farmers who are affected by it and who are attuned to it whose livelihoods are at, at stake and on the line. This will be often in the form of anecdotal evidence. As one farmer pointed out to me, and then several others did in very similar ways, when we keep a bucket of water out at night in December, it used to freeze when I was a small child. It doesn't freeze anymore. The community of climate scientists cannot deal with this kind of knowledge or information since there is no way to incorporate it into a general circulation model. But it's extremely useful to other farmers because they link it to whether apples can grow on this landscape or not because apples need freezing temperatures. We need to think of other ways to acquire, collate, and process this kind of information and knowledge at multiple scales, from the local, at least the national, in order to think about responses to these kind of changes, to adaptation, and to be able to respond proactively to changes in climate variability that <coughs> affect local livelihoods. I want to share a small story before I conclude. This is a story about uh, northwestern Himalayas where a lot of people grow a lot of apples and have been growing them for about 50 years now. This is uh, the apple production capital of India. It's temperate, it's very cold, and you know, Himalayas are very cold, it snows down there, up there. Beginning in the early 1990s, things started to change. And since then, in the last 20 years, the core production zone of apples has moved northwards by about 80 kilometers and upwards by about 1,500 feet. So that farmers at the southern edge of the shift can no longer grow apples commercially. It's just not viable. What has happened to these farmers who were heavily dependent on incomes from apples in the 1990s, 80s and 90s? 
as it so happens, and I'm, I'm working through, I'm collecting a lot of data, talking to a lot of people, but as it happens, forget about why and how, these farmers are now better off. They're getting more income out of selling, out of diversifying into a range of vegetables and other fruits. So instead of growing only apple, they are now growing up to 17 different kinds of products, diversified into vegetables and other temperate fruit crops that are not subject to the same constraints as apple is. And uh, they are actually very happy about their lot compared to 20 years ago. Are these farmers vulnerable? Were they vulnerable? Well, I'm sort of reminded of the Arizona farmers that uh, Ali talked about. Well, they did quite well for themselves. Evidently not vulnerable. Are they resilient? This is another term that keeps getting invoked in the climate change literature and debates. Well, transformative maybe, but definitely not resilient since there is no returning to the old times. It's changing. It's a completely different system now. And the people who are growing vegetables now, their farmers were growing apples, and their fathers were not growing apples. They were growing something else. And so far, all over India, over the last 20, 25 years now, I have met a lot of farmers, and just by a stroke of luck, I have asked them this question just because I was interested. Not a single farmer has told me that he or she, and I have talked to women as well, he or she is growing the same crops that their fathers were growing. Change is ubiquitous. Sometimes it's for the worse, other times it's for the better. And what happened to these farmers here is a kind of adaptation, but they didn't know that they were adapting to climate change. The institutions that helped these farmers make this transition from apple to a diversified portfolio of crops did not know that they were responding to climate change. They were just doing what they were supposed to do. The Horticultural Research Station was trying to spread, uh, experiment with and distribute germplasm about other fruit crops. The Agricultural Research Station was holding demonstration plots for crops that farmers could be selling to other markets. Every institution was just doing what it was supposed to do. And the problem that is highlighted by this case is that more often than not, the problem is institutions that do not, that do not do what they were set out to do and set up to do in the first place. And if we were to find a system, or find a way, find a process by which the suite of institutions that are already in place in many parts of the world to do specific things under a very large umbrella of you know, what we call development, if those institutions were just to do what they were set up to do, we probably do not need to think about climate change, definitely not in the same way that it is dominating our imaginations right now. Ultimately, the ability of these farmers to collectively hold their representatives accountable and force them to be responsive to their demands is the most important. And of course, this did not happen overnight. And this did not happen because of a scientific consensus or an international treaty. There were long and protracted struggles over more than a century before citizens in some places at some times were able to force the system to work for them. Democracy, in other words, was a hard fought battle. Ultimately, people will respond to threats and opportunities when they have the necessary entitlements and freedoms, something that has been invoked quite a few times today. When they have the necessary entitlements and freedoms that allow them to influence decisions that shape their lives and life prospects. But unfortunately, it doesn't seem like we are talking about entitlements or freedoms anymore. It's too neoliberal for us. Climate science has become hegemonic and brooks no opposition. It is scary enough for me when the prognosis is optimistic, wonders of genetic engineering, for example. But when the science is predicting doom, it crosses all bounds of reason. I will start believing 
in the climate change science when it is wrapped in a vision of emancipatory politics that I'm comfortable with. Until then, I will be a climate skeptic. Thank you very much.
uh, which uh, we can do, uh, uh, you know, as anthropologists or sociologists or geographers or you know, empirical social scientists. It's a very much of an empirical question that we are highly qualified to answer. Okay, so the problems of unification. I was actually intrigued that Halley said something about the fact that we might work best on climate change when we don't think about climate change at all, or I'm paraphrasing it a bit, which is actually rather like what Ashwini is saying. And I think that in order to deal with this, this hegemonic object which climate change threatens to become, we might acknowledge that lots of people working on entirely different problems which neither do they think are climate change related, uh, nor do they have any obvious connection to climate change, might nevertheless build the kinds of you know, robust social, natural worlds which actually best address climate change. Uh, so it forces us to look away from this central gaze of climate change is where it's at, to all the things that people are doing that in some sense nobody thinks are to do with climate change and yet somehow actually contribute best to climate change. Uh, maybe one example, you know, um, oh I don't know, herders with cows dealing with uh, grasslands in Mexico. Well, uh, they, they have to get their cows to live or their grasses to, uh, to carry on. And they don't have to think about climate change at all. They just have to think about cows and grasses and taxes and, and love. And if they carry on doing it well, then that will hopefully be a better world. Right? The climate change question is simply probably not relevant to their particular uh, uh, projects. OK, the problem of unification touched upon. I want to talk then about directions. Uh, in other words, I would say 99% of climate change research is about how the big impact comes down to the local place. Vulnerability and adaptation is always about what local people should do in the face of an outside force, which is explained to them by powerful actors like development brokers, government officials, and scientists, who position themselves as mediators of the powerful outside from the small, powerless local place. I think that's pernicious, because we have signed up for the social science of climate change is largely signed up for exactly this project of saying, how does the big stuff affect the small stuff, and we're going to help the small people deal with it. Right? We need to look in the other direction. We need to look at how political collectivities emerge, how they influence the state, how the state itself has to negotiate with powerful local political actors, this is something that you touch upon also, and therefore we need to direct our empirical gauge gaze not only on the local, but on the contrary, on the other arrow, how the local affects regional or even national levels of political action. Because otherwise, we allow ourselves to ignore both the bad and the helpful things that states and development organizations can do. They can do both. But in order to pay attention to the potentially negative aspects of state intervention, we need to focus our empirical gaze upon the state. Right? And I say the state, but I could just as easily say commodity chains. I could say political economy, so it doesn't matter, but it's the question of not focusing solely upon the local, but thinking about influences that go in two directions. This is one of the oldest questions in anthropology. Robert Redfield in the 1920s talks about the great tradition, the little tradition, uh, or, um, you know, and, and so influences between elites and non-elites always go both ways. It's one of the oldest chestnuts in anthropology, and yet we have allowed ourselves to forget it, and I'm gonna say the geographers have done better, Anthropologists have been kind of lamentable, and maybe we should hold it better. Okay, so let's look at both directions for arrows of conceptual and material influence. Right. Um, let's talk a tiny little bit about the power of fantasy and imagination. Um, so imagining climate change allows us to not think about other things. The way that climate change policy and science is done allows us to not notice a central fact. There isn't infrastructure and a, a process for taking fossil fuels out of the ground and putting them into the atmosphere. I think all of us, every time we give a talk on climate change, should have a picture of an open cast coal mine, another one of a power plant, another one of smoke going into the sky. Because most of climate change policy over the last 20, 30 years has been the story of those things increasing, not getting less. We are putting more into the atmosphere than we have ever done before. And, and you know, so far, not a lot of change on that front. And uh, I worry about this because uh, the principal policy action that Mexico has taken to deal with climate change has been to get poor people to stop cutting trees now, which seems like uh, a rather perverse uh, decision given where the carbon is coming from and, and where it's supposed to go, right? Uh, 
so it's what I would call a dis redistribution of client risk. Uh, and when you redistribute risk, it's usually a rich person saying to a poorest person, look, you eat my risk. Right? Okay, so finally, um, so, so, so we need to highlight these big processes that are continuing and which are in some sense being greenwashed by all of the research that we do that deals with policy implementation and doesn't pay attention to these large-scale projects. So I'm guilty as anybody of that kind of inadvertent greenwashing. Uh, maybe we can do better. Um, okay. Uh, climate change is attractive to developers because it triggers local places as places of absence. Local people don't know, they need to know, we can make them know. Right? And we know from many examples that whenever you uh, uh, define people as lacking something, you make yourself the giver of good things to them, knowledge, power, resources, love and affection, depends on the context, right? So, um, so one of the things that history does for us, or ethnography, or paying attention to history, is that instead of seeing the world as empty and a place of absence in need of climate change, science, and policy, we see it as full of history and power and politics, and we can ask how people with certain histories and certain landscapes and certain endowments can actually use climate change, and use the imagination of climate change to remake their politics. Uh, in that sense, I'm actually rather sympathetic to, to, to U.S. anti-climate change conservatives because they correctly understand that climate change, as it has been framed in the United States, is one of a statist expansion into the economy. They have a different politics. They don't want to do it. They correctly understand that the politics of climate change, as it has been framed in the United States, disempowers their own politics. They imagine climate change differently for those reasons. We need to take that quite seriously. So I'll stop there, but I think the, the big questions then are unification, change the arrow of our research from the local to look upward, and pay attention to history because it helps us understand how and why people have power to modify climate kind of policy. So we can call for questions if I can. <coughs> questions from the audience? I would just add to that. I think uh, at every scale in almost every part of the world, there are people, grassroots level or you know Rio plus twenty level, who are engaging, who are challenging these assumptions uh, around what? Sorry, sorry, no, I was at Rio plus twenty. They're, they're very, very, very engaged in these these assumptions. People outside, I'm sorry, I'm, but people outside the mainstream are engaged with challenging these this, this vocabulary or. Inside Both. Both. Okay. Well, anyway, I'll try to give yeah. some examples. I get Same. to talk later, so I'll shut up yeah. now. I'll try to give some no, examples. No. <laughs> it's okay. Right. Redistribution, yes. Yeah. Um, thank you for your talk. Very engaging. Uh, very um, 
engaging and interesting topic. I think it was mentioned earlier. We see the, the history of development policy and development theory. Uh, James C. Scott, as you mentioned, showed a lot of, of um, case studies in terms of you know, you know the uh, nation states going for this very high um, modernist type of uh, development policy. We saw it in the United States in terms of uh, what you talked about, national policies and, and masking it and other issues. It, I, I mostly did the uh, domestic work, but we would see this in urban renewal in terms of creating, getting rid of urban poverty and getting rid of the whole uh, neighborhoods. And you ended your, um, your talk about emancipation politics in terms of, of climate change. Uh, do you have any, uh, have you seen examples of where these emancipation politics are actually taking place in the global south? Yes, I have. And uh, I'm afraid uh, collectively we have not seen it because we are too busy talking about climate change. Uh, there are many examples that I can come up with. I will use two. One is India, that I know best. Um, if you look at the last decade or so, India has had several very progressive initiatives. And there are many other things going on, and corruption, and state violence, and I, I don't want to paint an excessively rosy picture. But compared to the 1980s or 1990s, there's some really progressive initiatives. There's a, a Right to Information Act, which is actually being implemented from below, because there are rural collectives who are exercising this new right to information by filling in applications and forcing bureaucrats to provide information within 30 days that the act says. And the act did not come about because some planner thought that it would be a good idea. It came about because there were groups all over India that were protesting against uh, uh, demanding transparency at the local level that came together and influenced their local representatives and it cascaded up to the parliament and resulted in a law that gave them this right. There is the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act that uh, gives uh, 100 days of uh, minimum wage labor to everyone, in, in anywhere. It is, uh, of course, it's sort of like a warfare instead of welfare, but still, it's uh, the first time that poor people in India have social security. And in many parts of remote places in rural India, where now liberal than I have witnessed it myself, poor Dalit women are saying, you know what? I don't have to take your shit anymore. It's extremely empowering. Of course, it's not all rosy. In many places, it's the same elites who have captured it. But the spaces have been created for these rural women, Dalit labor, to join together in groups of 20 to apply for a quarrying permit or some other job that the government will pay for to create assets at the local level. There is the uh, Forest Strikes Act, which uh, again, after 40 years of struggle, which I participated in for some time, where rural landless workers and uh, Adivasi peoples who had been labeled encroachers and criminals in the forest were finally able to convince their governments and the national government to pass a law that recognizes their claim to private type inside the forest and delegitimizes the forest department in its claims that these people are encroachers and criminals. There is now, for the last five years, a, a National Food Security Act, or the right to food, being debated, and it's coming up in parliament in uh, November. These are fantastic initiatives that provide entitlements and expand the scope of space of freedoms. None of them mention climate change. All of them will reduce vulnerability, social vulnerability. Because the people who are vulnerable to climate change are also vulnerable to so many other things. They are vulnerable to malaria, they are vulnerable to floods, there are all kinds of things that are not climate change. And it will help them deal with all their sources of vulnerability. Climate change is only one of them. That is one big example that I know of. The other big example that I think everyone should know of, we haven't paid enough attention, is uh, uh, the movement that brought Evo Morales to power and brought questions of energy and national policy to the forefront about what to do with all this natural gas. And even before Evo Morales uh, came to power in Bolivia, the uh, movement of uh, indigenous people in Ecuador and talking about who the oil belongs to and whether ExxonMobil and uh, uh, whoever else is exploring and extracting
extracting oil and who, who does the oil belong to and who does the earth belong to. And the indigenous movement that started in Latin America and Via Campesina and many other parts of the world coming together to propose an alternative that doesn't put climate change at the center of their worldview. Their imagination of a future is not really about climate change. But it will affect how these people will deal with the future where the climate is different or changing or perhaps it will be irrelevant. So let's go this way. Oh, I guess I would, um, I totally am fascinated by your talk, but I would just question how to talk about this with people who are doing climate research and who believe that their work is radical and is contributing to uh, data and information that could be used against um, institutional polluters that have been around for a long time. How would you discuss, how do you engage with those individuals who are doing the research? Okay. So I'm not saying you're saying it, but I want to repeat it. I'm not anti-science. I'm not even anti-climate science. I think we need to understand our climate much better. We need more research, not less, in figuring out how our climate works. It's just that right now it is not at a place where it is going to be useful. So we need more work, not less. But I guess the third it's the I translation of that science yeah. into actions. And the, the hubris that accompanies it, that is the scary part. If you're a scientist and working on climate science, Fantastic, more power to you. But to then take that imperfect, half-baked knowledge and then tell poor people in other parts of the world what to do is, is a complete dis So that is where I'm drawing the line. I'm, I'm sorry, yes, I agree. I'm maybe talking more about the fear that is associated with um, critiques of science that a lot of people who, who quote unquote believe in science seem to hold on to so dearly. And I don't necessarily agree that in this notion, but I, I know from the conversations I've had with colleagues that are climate scientists, they have a real fear of people who are science skeptics or you know, however you want to call it, because of the um, slippery slope away from what they're researching and finding, you know, from a political perspective. Well, all of us have to walk that fine line. And uh, if you're afraid, there is very little that, or if someone is afraid, there is very little I can give in terms of advice. But uh, there are other ways. I'm, I also walk that line, right? I, I want to get a job, I have to get tenure, I don't want to piss off my dean, which also includes a physicist. And uh, well, I, I write and publish without uh, so walking that fine line. And uh, it's something that we, we all have to do. <laughs> Unsatisfactory, I know. <laughs> yeah. um, I have a question um, about this kind of idea, this, the, the lack of fit between um, these abstract representations of climate science and what's happening on the ground. Um, and I'm wondering if, and, and you know, as you said, the idea that we might work best on climate change when we're not talking about climate science. But I wonder if also sometimes, um, in my work as a New Zealand, and, I'm, and, and I, I almost see that, that Bowery as indigenous people are kind of having this, this voice, um, uh, they're articulating an indigenous voice in part because what to do about climate change science is uncertain, right? And I almost, and, and I'm not sure if Michael's talk was saying this or not, but, but in Oakland there seems to be, you know, mobilization of social groups because of the uncertainty. Um, and I'm wondering what you think about that, if the uncertainty can also be a, a point for social groups to say, you know, we're not sure what policies we should be making. Um, state's not sure, let's try to get a voice in and, um, you know, say something. So maybe, maybe it's not as, hegemonic in those situations? Um. Uh, yes, there are such situations, and uh, lucky for you, because in most cases, unfortunately, the state knows exactly what it wants to do. There's no uncertainty in moving those people out of those slopes 
because they were vulnerable and the slopes were vulnerable and then they could plant trees there and get carbon credits. The state knows exactly what it wants to do with vulnerable people. That is the problem. And if there is uncertainty, that is a generative space. There's a lot of things that can be done there politically. And we have to create uncertainty, which is why I like the Tea Party's creation of uncertainty, because it opens up spaces that we can populate, but we don't. We, we end up fighting them instead of populating that space with other imaginations. <laughs> Change, you still need to, you know, 
know, distribute change these people because that's the best way of maybe generating some kind of adaptation. And, uh, and you know, other other stuff. So, kind of just like, I want to sort of grab up my mind around this and see, like, I don't want to end, you know, go out of this talk without like, looking at, oh, I don't, I, I shouldn't keep talking about climate change adaptation which I've been doing during the last, you know, my statement of workers who are coming here. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, it's, you have to do it. It's, uh, it's nothing, probably nothing would have changed without climate change. I don't know. Do I have a two minutes? Yeah, you have to find more. Yeah, two minutes, fine. <laughs> this, is a, this is a great uh, conundrum. I'm glad you think everyone here is a skeptic. I wish some, definitely more of them were. And I often get the, when I say that, I often get the feeling that people don't believe me when I say I'm a skeptic. So I definitely, because I have a, my biases are aligned with your <laughs> suspicion. Uh, but I disagree that uh, what, are, what are, we have to deal with it. No? We can go, I can go out and not talk about climate change. So I profoundly disagree with you that we have to talk about it. And this is something that I plan to talk about, but then didn't for a lot of time. It is that uh, we have participated in the creation of this monster, me included. And the best example of that is uh, Red Plus, right? Okay. Red Plus, whichever way you want to call it, reducing emissions for deforestation and forest degradation. And then that. Now it's much longer. I can't say it without stopping. <laughs> But uh, the program doesn't exist. <laughs> and it's impossible to keep up with the peer reviewed literature on Red Plus because I, I published a review with two of my co authors last year, and nobody on earth, leave alone three people who have other things to do, can read everything and review it for a journal. And all of this is because we are, it's a feeding frenzy. Yeah. Nothing else, and we are participating in it. And I wasn't <laughs> participating before that consciously, and I'm not participating after that consciously. And I think it is, a, it is about being reflexive. Is that being a skeptic is not about being ignorant. Being a skeptic is a political choice. It's a choice I'm making, that I'm skeptical of your science because of its implications for the people that I care about. Or for its origins. No, its origins are fine. Its origins are... Motivations. I don't care about the science itself. I am skeptical of genetic, genet genetically modified crops because of the control uh, of this technology by large seed corporations. If that science was publicly controlled by labs in the US or India and was free of patents and was done under democratically governed mechanisms and mm -hmm. checks and balances, I don't have a problem with the science. I'm skeptical of genetic, genetically modified crops because of the politics. And that is what I wanted to convey, is that I'm a skeptic not because I'm ignorant. I'm a skeptic because I know. And we can all make that choice. We can talk about other things. And if we all do, then there will be no climate change. Or there will be a different politics of climate. I think we cannot possibly improve in that final couple of sentences. So I'm just going to thank Ashwini and remind us all that uh, we have a break and we're going to have coffee and things like that to eat right now. And I did cheat and run over because we started late, but uh, we can be um, energized for our next panel.